everyone. In this video, I'd like to start talking about how we can choose what value or what number we're going to put in any particular cell in a raster, because we've got to make certain decisions about what value goes in each cell. So we need to be methodical about that. We need to be systematic about that. And we need to think about some of the theoretical issues that go into the choices that we make or the result from the choices that we make about uh, how we choose to code the cell. So let's go ahead and start looking at that now. Here is a very basic example, and we said that we were going to be using land cover as an example. I want to go ahead and continue with that. We were using that in the last video. So let's say that we're trying to create some data sets about land cover, and we're going to do it in raster, and uh, we're going to use this particular classification scheme over here. We're interested in water and grassland, forest and urban areas. And now I have this image here of the uh, reservoir in Central Park in New York. And I've got a raster that is sitting on top of it. Again, a very simplified raster. It's just got a few cells in it, just for the sake of example here. And let's say that I need to code this raster for a land cover for some analysis that I'm going to be doing. Well, in this instance, that's pretty easy. I mean, how should each one of these cells be coded? Well, they're water, and that's very easy to determine. So I can just stick one in each one of these cells. And maybe for the sake of example here, we'll just color the cells that have water in blue. That's really easy. And if I'm trying to do analysis in this area, then uh, way to go. That's, that's going to be very simple. But it's not always that simple. Let's go to another example. Here I've got an image of Yosemite National Park here. And it is largely forest, that's right, but then I've got this grid that I put over it in order to establish the raster. And then I start to take a look at, well, you know, I've got the a lot of forest over here, but then I also have uh, this area in here, okay, which looks like it's going to be grassland of some kind. But then, you know, I also have, when you look over here, I've got this, I think this is a road right here that's running through. So the first thing that I would notice or point out here that if I'm just coding for these over here, water, grassland, forest, and urban areas, then I'm potentially, or I am, I'm not going to be able to represent this, this road that goes through here. I'm going to, and that's not going to be present in my data set. So that's a choice about the representation that's going to be made. But then I also have these issues over here with some of these cells that are not 100% one way or another. I mean, obviously, if I'm not representing the road here, then maybe, okay, it's forest, with the understanding the road's being omitted. But over here, I've got some grassland, and this one is grassland, but then I've got some cells which uh, are a mix of both. And how do I do that? What, what, how do I handle that situation? What's the best way to handle that situation? Well, of course, best, again, is going to depend on what purpose you're going to be putting the resulting raster to. But these are the sorts of issues that we have to think about and that come up even when we're trying to do this kind of work in a situation like this that, yes, in this national park here, most of this is forest. But there are other things that we have to think about, and when you really start taking a look at the area, uh, issues come up that we really need to address that we might not have thought of before. So let's take a look at another example. Here we've got a, a much more detailed view of New York. This is at the edge of Central Park in New York City. And you can see that there's lots of stuff in New York, even for a simple land cover uh, sort of raster. I've got trees here, I've got roads, there are buildings, I've got the park as well. And how are you going to represent this with a raster? If I'm saying that we need a land cover raster for this area of New York in order to do some kind of analysis. Well, the first thing that is going to be very significant about the raster that I produce is what I'm choosing to include. I'm just, in this case, I just want water, urban areas, and park. Well, maybe there are no water areas in this area that I'm looking at right now, but there are urban areas, and then there are parks, and then there are some cells that are a little bit of both. Uh, but, you know, I could become more sophisticated. Maybe I'm interested in buildings. Maybe I'm interested in the park as well. I'm trying to separate the road out. I mean, I see a lot of other things in here that I could potentially include as land cover that are going to be simplified, are going to be generalized over by the use of this very simple classification scheme that I'm trying to uh, use over here, just water, urban areas, and the park. 
Let's continue with some examples here in uh, New York around Central Park, but I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So here we have the area around Central Park in New York City. We are trying to create a land cover raster that is going to just be very simple here. We're just going to be talking about where are the water areas, where are the urban areas, and where are the park. And I've got just a simple code of one, two, and three going on here. Well, when we start off, there are some cells that are probably fairly obvious. So I'm just going to start by going ahead and putting these cells in, because these are the ones that seem to be 100% uh, one thing or another, or that were very obvious as to what they were. So I went ahead and coded them 1, 2, and 3. But then I have all of these other cells here, which are a mix in some way, and I'm going to have to come up with some systematic way of figuring out how I want to code the uh, cell. And you know what? I kind of like this because take a look at this mixed cell down here. Take a look, this looks like this is water here, but I've got this, looks like a boat going by right here. And so, you know, maybe a human being who looks at this would go, oh, well, I guess this is a water cell because whenever this image was taken, well, I've just got this boat that's going through here. But if we were trying to do some type of automated classification scheme for this, well, those are the little things that can throw you off sometimes or throw the computer off. If you're saying, hey, I need this to be uh, you know, completely water, and the, uh, the computer says, well, I have something else in here. I've got this, this shape over here, and you're like, oh, well, that's not actually part of the city. That's just a boat that's going by. So that's kind of, uh, kind of interesting there. But okay, well, I, I have this problem of mixed cells. The first thing that I would like to, to point out is that this is not a problem that I can solve just by changing my spatial resolution. I think that's what most people want to do. The first thing they want to do is say, well, gee, uh, I've got a spatial resolution of something for each one of these cells. And actually, I don't have that written down here. here. But each one of these cells is covering is representing the same amount of area here in New York. And we could go and figure out exactly what the spatial resolution of this raster is. But somebody might say, well, what we need is a raster with a higher spatial resolution. And so we might choose to construct a raster grid that looks like this. That might provide a better data set for the purposes to which it's being put, but it doesn't solve the problem of the mixed pixels. So now I've got these that are solid, but I've got some cells that are still mixed. In fact, I've probably increased the number of cells that I'm going to have to make a decision for. You know, there were only so many of them that were still empty when I had it at a different spatial resolution. When I increased my spatial resolution, I can get more detail in a certain sense, but I've also increased the number of cells which are not purely one thing or another, and so I've actually increased the number of decisions that I'm going to have to make across the data set. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the different methods that we can use to figure out what these uh, mixed cells should be. And we'll go back to the uh, lower spatial resolution for the sake of our example, so it's a little bit easier to see. But let's take a look at some different methods you might use. There are several, but let me give you an idea here. First of all, you might choose to use the majority method. You might say, well, yeah, I might have some cells that are urban areas and parks or water and urban areas, but whichever of those has the most, whichever of those land covers occupies the majority of the cell is the one that I'm going to code it for. And that's great. That sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do to me. Other people may choose to use the centroid. I say, well, you know what? We'll just pick out the very center of every single cell. And whatever is at the very center is how that cell is going to be coded. That's also a very common way to go about doing this, and it also seems to make a whole lot of sense to me as well. Another way you can go about doing this is by importance, or making some kind of rank judgment about all of the different land covers you're interested in. For instance, what if, for your purposes, you are conducting a study of water? And so you say, well, what's most important to me is water. That's what I'm studying. So if a cell has any amount of water whatsoever, I'm going to code it as water because that's what I'm studying. Or, you know, I'm really trying to study urban sprawl. So well, that's what's most important to me. So if a cell has any amount of urban area, that overrides everything else. And I'm going to create 
uh, or code that cell for urban. And that's fine. This is why you create these data sets and so forth for particular purposes. What's best? Well, it's only what's best for your purpose. The important thing is that the choice must be applied in every case across the raster and recorded so that it can be communicated to the user uh, in the raster's metadata. The choices that you make for your systematic way to code the cell is going to influence what the data set looks like or what the data set is, of course, right? So it's important to make sure that you communicate that information to any potential users of your data set through metadata or through some other means so that they know how the data set was created. Because if you used one of these importance criteria, you know, a rank criteria, and said oh, what I'm most interested in was water, if it had any water in it, then I went water with my cells, well, somebody else may be doing a study where they really care about the urban areas. And so you've decreased the amount of urban areas and, and, and increased the amount of water in the representation in that data set because you said, hey, water overrides everything else. But if I'm interested in studying the urban areas, maybe I would have preferred for the urban areas to uh, have overridden anything else in mixed pixels. And that's what I need. Maybe if I run my analysis using the data set that was created your way, I would get incorrect answers for mine. So purpose is very important. Communication of this in metadata is very important. Let's take a look at some examples going back to New York. So here is our original classification within the mixed pixels that we need to uh, continue to work with. So let's use a centroid classification scheme to classify the rest of these cells. So what I'm going to do is just overlay these little center dots. So I tried to go in and put a dot at the very center of every cell. And then we can look at the center of every cell and go, okay, what is it? Is it water? Is it urban areas? Is it whatever? And then we'll code that cell according to that center. And if you do that, well, this is what you end up with. That's what's at the very center of each cell. And I think I can get rid of, uh, yeah, get rid of the little dots again so that you can, you can see the classification here. So that's what uh, coding this raster by the centroid method would look like. That's what we would end up with for a land cover raster. Let's look at another way. So here we are starting with our 100% our covered pixels, still dealing with the mixed pixels, but this time I'm going to run a majority classification scheme. And some of these, I went through and I looked at all of them. Most of them are pretty clear of which the majority is, but there were some of them that were, that were still a little bit close, but uh, at least for visual inspection. But if you go through and do the majority classification scheme, you end up with a raster that looks like this. So it's a little bit different than the centroid raster. Let's take a look at another example where we might do this by rank. So here we are again. We this time establish a priority. So I wrote this over here in the corner. But let's say that uh, the water is my highest priority. I really want to make sure that I get all of the water. And then my second highest priority is park. And then my third highest priority, or the lowest priority in this case, would be urban areas. So water overrides everything, then park overrides urban. So what happens if I classify this using this scheme? Well, I get a raster data set that looks like this. Again, something a little bit different. So I think uh, let's line these up and take a look at them. Here are three different representations of the Central Park area in New York. I've got three different raster data sets that are similar but yet are different. You can take a look at all at the differences here and see the different methods which gave me you know, different results. So which one of these is the correct representation of the area? Well, of course, I can't answer that question because it has to be all about your particular purpose. That can only be answered in relation to your particular purpose. But what is very important to realize here is that when you have a raster data set, just like sort of any data set, but when you've got a raster data set like this, you are not seeing the raster data set. You're not seeing the data set that could be created about this particular area. You're only seeing one possible data set that could be created to represent this particular area.
That's very important. There could be other ways of representing the area. There could be better ways of representing the area for the purpose to which you are planning on putting it. Think about all of the different assumptions that are going into creating these different raster data sets. I mean, the first assumption is, or the first specification that had to happen was that I do have a very spe uh, specific spatial resolution here. Uh, whatever the spatial resolution of this raster is, it's been specified and was created. But we did look at creating something with an even higher spatial resolution. We could look at something with a lower spatial resolution. Changing the spatial resolution that I'm going to use to, to create these rasters will create a different raster data set. Then I went through and specifically said that, look, uh, what I'm interested in classifying this area into are the water, park, and urban areas anyway. Right? I made that decision up front. If you said uh, water, uh, park, and then maybe you are distinguishing between like harbor areas and then interior parts of the city and wanted to have four different groups here, uh, four different classifications or categories, then we would end up with a different raster data set, obviously. Then the, uh, another assumption that was made was whichever one of these particular coding methods was used to handle mixed cells. So that's a lot of assumptions to be made for any particular data set. And that's why we can't just say, oh, this is the representation. You do have to be critical of your data. How was this data set created? What assumptions were uh, made when this data set was created? How would this data set look different if I had some different assumptions or if I changed something? And then would that be better or worse for my particular application? So keep this in mind. I think this is a, a great little exercise to go through here because of the differences in representation that you get. I mean, there was this little park down here. I think this is interesting that, you know, only using the priority classification scheme the way we had things set up did uh, these little this little park down here show up because I think the park is like just halfway. It's a little green green area, a little park that I think is sitting halfway between these two cells. And so it didn't show up on centroid and didn't show up on my majority. It only showed up here when I prioritized the classification of parks over urban areas. Also lost a, a, a couple of pixels of uh, urban areas up here. This cell right here is interesting because you know it might not actually be a park. It may just be some green area that is uh, uh, running along the edge of the water. And so that's something else to think about. Is that actually a park or is that just green area? And then is that something that uh, I want to be able to distinguish between in the data sets? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So that's another assumption we would need to dig into and handle how we want to take care of it. All right, so that's an introduction to coding raster cells when you're trying to do a qualitative kind of land cover or create a land cover data set like this, some of the issues that you're going to be running into. All right, well, I'll see you in the next video.